Today, we're going to take a look at some of the best robots and analyze some matches from the FTC decode season this week. And the key point here is that it doesn't matter if I'm Coach Pratt. And I've been teaching robotics since I'm for over a decade now, and I've mentored FTC teams to winning national championships. And today we're going to take a look at some different chassis designs that teams have come up with, some ways you can make your shooter a bit more effective, ways you can make your sensors more effective, some really interesting autonomous paths that your team might want to try out in the future, and then also take a look at some more defense-style plays that your team can make this season. So first off here, we've got a video from Load Robotics, and they're showing off a what looks like a really heavy steel flywheel on side of their rubber bands. So they've got a, a rather thick looking uh, compliant wheel here, and then they have two really thick chunks of steel. First, let's talk about why this design works. It does increase the rolling inertia of your flywheel. So having heavier objects means that when a artifact goes through that ball or goes through your shooter, it's less likely to slow down. So you can have a higher throughput on your design. On the flip side, it also means that your fly was going to take longer to spin up, but it means you could be able to spin this thing for a lot longer during the match as well. Now, having a really heavy flywheel works really well for a team that might have a consistent RPM and is changing your load. If you have too heavy of a flywheel, what can happen is if you have this large range of RPMs, like if you're in the back, you want, say, an 1800 RPM, but if you're in the front, maybe you only want 1200, being able to break or slow this flywheel back down is going to be a challenge just because of how much inertia it does end up having. But it does mean you can get a really high throughput through that. So it might be something that you consider for your design. Next up here, we've got a video from Clutch Robotics. It looks like 3435. And they've got a, a nine artifact motif here. But what's really interesting about this robot is I want you to take a look right here at its hooded shooter because it actually looks like the hooded shooter itself is on a linear slide. So let's take a look at this as it comes around. So we can see that it's actually moving it up and down now. The reason I think it's on some sort of linear slide as opposed to a rack and pinion system is we can see that there is quite a bit of moving and inertia on this. It's possible it's on a rack and pinion system, but it's a really interesting way that I haven't seen yet of moving a hooded shooter around. Taking a straight up guess as to why this might be the case for this, a few thoughts. One, if they have their hooded shooter in the back, it's possible that they have so much inertia that the robot is actually starting to kind of do kickstands and starting to actually pick itself up and off the ground. That's a possibility. Another possibility I've thought of is that it could be an indexing section for them. So depending on where they end up picking up the balls, they could move this at any point along their system. And this allows it to either pick up a green ball from the section, from the middle, or from the front. And that is an interesting way of being able to pick that up. It clearly means that on the hooded shooter itself somewhere, there must be some way for that ball to get up and into the hooded shooter. I think this is a really compact solution and an interesting way of getting around the problem of how do we sort out indexing? Because uh, it's an index design that I haven't seen yet. And it's really creative from 34 through 5. And it clearly works pretty well. Let's take a look at it again to be able to show if it can do its index. So it's green, purple, purple. Looks like it's able to do purple, green, purple. It picks up three again here. Now this one's obviously in the original pattern before, but it looks like it's able to index itself as it moves through picking up that ball. And my mistake, sorry, it's actually, looks like it's a 12 uh, motif auto. So very cool job on that and really creative design out of that team, 3435. Next up, We've got a nine artifact autonomous from team 14468. And I don't want to show this robot off because I think it's got a really interesting chassis design. Look how skinny this chassis is. This is going to make it really easy for them to be able to get that full park up on the inside. And that's mostly just showing teams that there's not just one square chassis design that's going to work. Now, it looks like they're also able to uh, index this robot as well. We'll see as this last one comes through whether this one's capable of being indexing or not. It'll have to go green, purple, purple for it to be able to launch in. So it's not currently capable of indexing. Still a really interesting chassis design to take a look at. You don't have to fill up that entire space, and it's possible you can just pick things straight up and go right into it. It also makes it a little simpler for your drivers in that they don't think that the robot is wider than it actually is. I also want to show up here Team Bearded Dragons. 
I think this is really fun when FTC teams just have a little bit of a good time. They've got teeth on the front of the roll, but they've got googly eyes as this thing drives around. You can actually see the googly eyes actually wiggle inside of the robot. Uh, I think that's just a lot of fun, and I like seeing uh, students just enjoying their time as they're designing their robot around. So <laughs> nice work on that. I'd love to see this thing up on the field. Next up here, we've got a super impressive auto to take a look at here from Team uh, Theseus. I think I'm correcting that correctly. Uh, they've got an 18 artifact auto. And the robot you want to take a look at here is the robot down in the bottom. And specifically, I want you to take a look at how it goes about running its autonomous path. Because I think that a lot of teams can learn from this and it's a really creative way of being able to get more balls. This robot up here in the front is being used to open up and close the gate. So now take a look at this path here. So it's able to pick up the front three at the top, fire another three, and here it comes down, grabs the bottom three, comes up, and then it's going to come up to the top to launch another three. And this robot just continues to cycle through the bottom section and then through the top section. And so it'll go through one and then two and then keep reversing back between those systems. This is a really slick way. Uh, I've seen some teams at the start of the season just go straight back and forth the whole time. But I think having an alternating pattern allows them to be able to pick up some stragglers. Because as you're going to see, or as you can see in this, sometimes artifacts don't always sit back here like as they're coming up it's possible that they're not able to actually uh, grab some balls over here and being able to cycle themselves up here after uh, is a really slick way of being able to pick up some of those artifacts so really nice autonomous pathing on that theosis robotics and a nice work on that team twenty six thousand. next up here we've got electric cohogs 252 so this is a clearly a very veteran team uh, and I don't want to show off this autonomous pathing because I, I don't, I haven't seen some teams use this strategy because I want to take a look at here how it takes a little pause, picks ones up, take a little pause, picks ones up, take a little pause, picks ones up. It looks like the pause may not be due to their intake not being able to reliably pick things up, but it looks like it's mostly related to their indexer. So it allows them to stop and have that, give that indexer time uh, for it to be able to pick it up. Another really interesting little section down here on this robot. Uh, so it's able to index, very impressive work. I want you to take a look at how their shooter ends up working. So they take a little pause, be able to pick it up, and then move it in. Now, if you take a look right here, they've got a little lever arm that is kicking it up. So just watch down in that little section, you can see that lever arm sliding it up the arm to be able to get it up into their flywheel there. Another thing I think teams can think about in this launching here is I want you to think about where along the launch line you decide to rest your robot to actually do its shooting pose. In my opinion, you want to think about where's the most efficient place that you can drive where you can add up extra time. Because the more time that you spend strafing back to one section or going to another section or going all the way to another section, the shortest path is going to get you the most time inside of this autonomous section. Uh, and uh, here, this robot takes time to go all the way back to the center, which means it's adding an additional, you know, 50 centimeters each time as they come forward and back. Or as they lift themselves up here, because they have a little pause so that their indexer has time to respond. If they had decided to shoot from this section in here, it means they don't have to move back quite as far. Now, it's possible that their flywheel doesn't allow them to be able to shoot from that close. But if it does, it is a bit of a automation or a bit of a, a path optimization that they could try out. Next up, we've got Team Lux Mechanica, 30,789. Uh, they've got a little robot reveal here. Mostly, I want to show the inside of the robot for this one, and particularly this gigantic LED strip or LED strip on the inside of the robot. Uh, they've clearly got color sensors on the inside of the robot, and it's just a good reminder that having a consistent color environment and a consistent lighting environment for those artifacts that they go in is really critical for sensors and their success. Next up, we've got a match here from the Lancaster area qualifier. And in this match, I want you to take a look at the defense that's going to get played against this white robot up here. And particularly against, it looks like their limelight is mounted on the front of their rover right here. And this is a good note for teams to play defense against and for teams that have a limelight on their robot to have that limelight at a very high position. And we're going to take a look at why. Uh, we can see that this robot here, 
the blue robot as it comes in is actually is stopping the limelight from being able to reach and see that April tag over there in that corner. And because of that, we're going to see this thing is just going to launch balls straight out. And without having a, a good faith attempt, that's a minor foul each time that ball comes out again. We can actually see it happen again at some point here. I believe it happened a little sooner in the match as well. In that being able to block someone's limelight, I think is a really, it's a good technique to be able to stop them from being able to launch because stopping your posing lines from being able to get points also gives yourself points inside of that match as well. Well, it doesn't actually give you points, but it can be just as good as scoring a point yourself in some scenarios. Not all, but in some scenarios for sure. So watch your limelight placement for that one, teams. Next up here, we've got the Northern California, I believe, a place-based number six qualifying tournament. And I want you to take a look at what happens to the blue robot around the gate here and i believe that it is this blue robot that we want to take a look at so this is a very dangerous position for the blue robot to be in and you'll see why because take a look at what team 25725 does to this blue robot here coming up we'll see it gets about out of the way and then right there team 25725 unloads seven of the loaded artifacts plus hits this robot into the gate so that is a major foul for every single artifact that comes out and a major foul for hitting the gate itself that's eight major fouls that is a 120 point swing and it makes it from a match where blue was ahead with 48 points to 42 points on red to now being very much behind and the key point here is that it doesn't matter if the red robot pushed the blue robot in regardless of where things are going or who initiated that contact it is still the problem of the blue robot connecting with that artifact and that ends up being a foul against blue and in favor of red here so this is another good reminder to teams that you need to avoid that opposing gate zone like the plague stay away from that section uh, and this is a exact critical reason as to why. Next up, we've got another team here from team 9102. Probably not their favorite way of showing this, but this is just a good example of a foul. And I think where you could have a better placement and uh, a good reminder that I don't think enough teams put enough effort into their electrical wiring systems. This isn't to say that Ash Printing or this team uh, 9102 isn't putting a ton of effort in the wiring, but it's a good reminder that mm, maybe we should stick things up. They've got their battery box hanging out here, and this battery is just hanging free in the wind before they have to actually attach that back in. If you if you're, have no energy for your robot, you can't compete. Your electrical systems need to be bulletproof. Uh, and it's a really good reminder to check some of these things out before you get started in there. I would suggest that having a battery box on the outside of your robot is a rather poor place to put it. It should be hidden somewhere inside because you don't want another robot coming in, connecting with it, pinching one of those wires, making a short on your main uh, power system. Last up here, we've got a Australian Nationals champ here from their uh, finals match. And I want you to take a look at the defense that's going to be played inside of this for their teleop period. It looks like for this match, this blue robot is out of commission. Something seems to be wrong. I'm not sure what happened to the team. But I want you to take a look at the defense that uh, team 14380 is going to be playing against both of these robots, but particularly against the Theasis robot that we saw a little bit earlier today. Because uh, I think it's some really impressive defense being played. And also a good reminder to teams that if their robot dies in the middle of the match, or something happens, uh, they're still capable of uh, playing well and playing strong. But they're about to kick into a different strategy here where they start playing some really hard, aggressive defense against the red team. So much so that they end up causing this robot here to have quite a few fouls uh, throughout the game. So right there, those are now fouls against red because it's pushing them out. Let's watch that again. Take a look at the Theus robot down here in this corner as the blue buck comes in to push them out of the way for them to be able to fire some of those balls. 
So here he goes, take a look at this. It's actually now pushed them out of the launch zone and Theosis continues to fire out of that. Uh, that's some really well-played defense because each one of those balls that fires out is a minor foul. And if it goes into the goal, uh, I could be incorrect on this, but I'm pretty confident that it's a major foul as well. So you end up causing some pretty large fouls there too. So even as it comes into that short zone, you can see that it's able to kick itself out. And really kudos work on Theosis to be able to still fight up against that really hard defense as being played by this uh, blue robotics. But it is a good reminder for teams that as you are testing and practicing in your drivers, if you have another FTC team in your region or in your school or in your community, you should connect with them or have a second chassis, something along those lines, and practice under non-ideal conditions. So get lots and lots of time on the field practicing underneath non-ideal conditions so that these robots can practice shooting and firing at a time when it's going to be in actual competition basis. If you're looking for more robotics resources, CAD files, code snippet files, things like that, you can consider joining my robotics community down below. If you have an interesting match or an interesting aspect on your robot that you'd like the rest of the community to be able to see and potentially be featured on a future FTC Fridays, submit that in the submission form down below. And as always, best of luck out there this FTC season.